Welcome everyone, hopefully you guys are doing awesome. My name is Itai, PogChamps 2 quarterfinals is kicking off today with the matchups of Dog Dog against Wagamama, Gripix against David Pacman, and XQC against Scissors. I'll be covering all of the games today, as well as many games in the future, so make sure you guys subscribe so you keep yourselves updated. Our first match of the day is Dog Dog against Wagamama. Dog Dog is a very good player, but Wagamama is probably the best in the whole tournament because he has, well, he has a fantastic rating of like 1400, um, and in general, he's just a very strong player. So it's very surprising that he fell into a very common trap in the London system where you place your knight on f3 and your bishop on d3, like in this game, uh, Wagamamba decided to do. And now there's always this possibility of e5 and then e4 forking these two pieces because they're obviously placed in positions where they can be forked with a pawn. And that's exactly what ends up happening. So you'll notice that the queen moves over to e8, preparing this push. Uh, the bishop, or sorry, the rook moving to e8 is probably better because you're centralizing a rook. But nonetheless, the queen moves here, preparing the push. And the push is, well, the push is played. And now the bishop can move back, um, or you can take. It doesn't matter because the, the point is, you're going to get this fork in, um, and you're already going to have a big advantage in the start. And so Wagamama already has some material to come back from. The knight moves over here, trying to trade pieces, which is very smart if you have an advantage. Um, the pieces end up being traded, and now this is kind of a tricky situation. The bishop goes over here to a4, and the bishop on a4 uh, makes this pin here with the knight. And so the point is, after you trade on this d-file and you open up the file, you can try to maybe stack a rook and a queen onto this knight, and with the added pressure of the bishop, you could win this piece. So this is a chance for white to try to get back the material and so it's very nice that white does not trade here and instead keeps this pin here the queen moves out of the pin which is very smart so the knight can move away and we see e4 c4 and d or sorry e4 d4 and c4 which is very rare to see so uh, you know moves like e5 are now possible which could be very very uh, weird and could be very good for white um here i don't like this move um, because the truth is, after h6, you kind of have to come back. You can also maybe reroute here. But the point is, you maybe weakened a little bit of the structure here, but you lost a tempo for it. So I would not recommend it. We see a6, maybe trying to eventually play b5 and take away this piece here, because the piece is uh, guarding the e8 square. And you obviously want to move your bishops onto d8 and e8. So the bishop here is very annoying. Um, so maybe black has ideas of rerouting this bishop, and then because of that, having the rook here supporting this push. But instead, uh, he decides to go ahead and play e8 anyways, you know, not realizing that the bishop can simply take. And so the material is gained back. Um, so both players are equal. Now, one big thing about this position is that the queen and the king are aligned. You always want to be looking for this in your games. Um, because, you know, now tricks... Uh, such as g4, um, maybe trying to take away or trying to to motivate uh, black to play g5 are now possible because you have the you know you always have the move e5, uh, you know making this discovery here and winning the knight. So in general, when there's these you know when there's this connection here with the king and the queen, there could be a lot of tactics that happened, and so it's very good. For example, here you know if black decides to play this move, you obviously have this check winning the knight. Um, so it's very good that black brought the king away from this diagonal and, you know, into a much more safe position, but because he had to spend, you know, time moving the king here and here, or sorry, here and here, he allowed white to push, uh, g4 and then g5 and open up this h file. And so the queen can maybe try to maneuver here and with the help of a knight, it could be very annoying. The knight is moved back, um, and we notice this queen here pinning the knight um, which is which also could be very dangerous because now g4 you have ideas maybe of g5 as well so this could be very dangerous um, but the bishop uh, just moves simply back unpinning the knight uh, stopping this forking potential and making a possible discovery of its own onto the queen so the, the bishop coming to g7 is a very good move uh, the rooks are stacked and in this position both players are down on the clock so they want to start you know making moves fast and because of that wagamama falls into a fork here, uh, winning the, the, the exchange, and so he has even less material now, but he does find a very nice way to take advantage of this open file. He sends his queen onto h4, um, and once the king moves, 
with the help of a knight, he ends up, you know, causing a lot of trouble for Black. Black in this position just takes, the queen takes the pawn, and now f1, the king moves back here, and there's obviously checkmate. So even with the material disadvantage, he finds a very nice way to form an attack with these three pieces, and that's how he wins the first game. Let's move on to game two. So Wagamama now has the black pieces, and he plays the Karu Khan. And Dog Dog decides to go ahead and sacrifice a piece. He can obviously take back, but decides instead to sack the piece and play c4. Um, I would not recommend this. The point of this move is maybe to try to get an advantage in development. And gambits are very nice, you know, if, if you have a lot of theory behind them. But this one, I just think this is such a central piece that it could become very annoying for white. And in general, that, that extra, you know, tempo that you might get might not be very valuable. Um, in fact, you see the move f3, which is actually a move that I quite like. You're um, allowing this, you know, this extra pawn to be, um, you know, to, to get two pawns instead. So essentially, the extra material that black has, you're allowing that to become permanent, but you are getting more, uh, you're, you're getting more material um, into the game. So this could be a good plan. Instead, black doesn't take, kicks the bishop back, threatening now to win the bishop. So the move a3 is necessary to, you know, bring the bishop back. Um, and after you trade here, white has a very solid position. Already a lot of pieces in the board. So now that you had the addition of f3, I think white's position is completely fine. And look at this. Black just has four pawns out and no other pieces. So this could be very good for white if they continue this momentum and continue attacking. So the king castles um, potentially preparing attacks here on, on this very weak f7 square. So this is very nice. In fact, already preparing attacks. And there's only one good move here. Um, everything else loses, or not loses, but is not very good. The only good move is g5 because you are now blocking this knight um, from getting captured uh, because then if the knight gets captured, this, this square is obviously hanging. So you play the move g5 to try to take away this uh, connection between the bishop and the knight, but instead in the game, Wagamama plays f6, the knight is taken, and then this is a huge blunder, the queen moves to h5. Why is this a blunder? You're adding more attackers into the attack. It seems very good, but the point is now the queen no longer uh, you know, keeps an eye on this very weak d4 square, and so the move queen takes d4 in ch you know, check is very much possible. In fact, once the king moves, you even win the knight here. So now black has a very big advantage, and Wagamama you know, is just in a very bad position. He does find a wonderful move. Uh, knight to e4, the point is to add pressure onto f6, um, and at the same time, if the bishop moves back, allow this, this pawn to be taken here. So this is a very good move, but um, after he does this, he actually doesn't take back the queen. So what you'll notice is that the knight takes the bishop, the queen takes, you can take and then retake. So this is obviously what you were looking at to win material back, but instead you move the, the queen away. So this is a huge blunder. Um, and white could have had a way better position here. Um, instead, black obviously does not. And now this pawn is hanging, um, which can come with a very serious attack on the knight and also on the rook. Um, but instead of taking it, the move rook to, to f2 is played. And now after bishop b7, this is even better because you're actually forking uh, all of these three pieces. Um, there is one possible move that saves them all, which is bishop back here. Um, to c8 because the bishop guards everything here but the point is that's a pretty hard move to find and instead the bishop takes here the rook takes the queen moves um, pinning the rook here preparing maybe to bring the other rook the queen takes the rook there was a checkmate possibility if you took here but instead the queen takes the rook and now the rook comes in the game and this is a huge blunder this is a very massive blunder because white actually can lose now um, or not lose but draw the game because after take take you have this forced, um, yeah. Oh, you have this forced draw here line, um, and, and black is just going to get a draw. But instead of this, what ends up happening is after take take, the so black had an opportunity to force a draw, but instead the king moves here, um, the queen moves back, stopping this draw line, and from here it's basically game over. Um, you'll notice a few more blunders, especially the the queen is a big one, but you're you have maybe twenty seconds on the clock, so you're trying to get moves in quick. 
but the game ends. So you'll notice that in this position, Wagamama has one win and Dog Dog has one win. So we're going to game three to see who wins the match. For the final game, Wagamama has the white pieces and begins with the exact same opening that he did in the first game, only this time not playing bishop d3 immediately, but playing it um, on move 7. So there is still potential to run into the exact same trap that happened in the first game, but instead white probably is a lot more cautious of this and will you know realize that if the queen tries to support this, you have to do something to stop it. Um, in fact, e4 is um, the trap from ever happening, um, and we end up seeing the, the queen moving over here to e8. Anyways, some, some trades here happen, um, and then instead of, uh, once the bishop is taken, instead of taking back, uh, white decides to counterattack here, forking these two pieces. The queen moves uh, to c8, you take, the queen takes, um, and I'm going through these moves a lot faster, um, but also because black and or both players had um, a lot less time, about maybe five minutes for each, a very you know minimal amount of time to play chess and so they rushed through the moves and they didn't think as much as they would have in the other matches in fact here we see a huge blunder uh, the knight takes the bishop rather than retaking you trade here the queens and now the knight is safe here and so you end up losing material and so wagamama already has a disadvantage some pawns are taken uh, white tries to use its rooks to the best of its abilities by taking all these pawns but the truth is these two bishops here are very bad um, for white because they control a lot of, uh, of these key critical squares. So black can actually take the rook here. Instead, the king moves back. But again, the bishop now controls this square. So there's all these very important squares that the, the bishops control. So once again, that's showing uh, once, the move, um, once the rook moves to f3. Once again, both players have a very small amount of time. So they didn't have the same chances as last time to try to think. But in this position, you know, white resigns just because of how hard it is to come back from such a deficit. Um, and that's how the match ends. So Wagamama actually gets a loss, which is something I really did not expect. Um, but that's actually, you know, how the match ended. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you guys subscribe if you want more of these videos coming at you every single day. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.